Okay, here we go, y'all. Um, this is gonna be an exciting interview. Sitting down, this is a fascinating figure right here. Uh, how do I describe him? P I M P. Um, founder of the hip hop fraternity, author, filmmaker. Please welcome my brother, Pimpin' Ken. Ken, what up? Thank you for having me, brother. It's an interesting platform. I I, I like the introduction. You you one of the few people that put commas on my on my lifestyle. <laughs> Most people say <laughs> Pimpin' Ken. Period. <laughs> Nah, nah, you 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 gotta put them commas where they belong. Like, like I understand the difference between a comma and a period. You you don't wore so many hats across the board, man. I, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't include them commas. Mm-hmm. Thank you. My brother. Yeah, you know, and I want you got such a fascinating story. And I want to go back to the beginning and then bring it current. Is that cool with you? Yeah, that's what's up. My brother. Okay, where'd you grow up, Ken? It was the Midwest, correct? Yeah, I was born in Chicago. You know, uh, uh, when I was around 14, I kind of caught a murder, attempted murder case. And, uh, you know, I was in the Cook County Jail, one of the youngest uh, inmates in there, me and my brother. And then we eventually beat that charge and went to Milwaukee. And uh, we moved to Milwaukee to get away from Chicago. Ended up going to jail there for uh, forgery, for check cashing. And so uh, a portion of my younger years, I spent in, in and out of reformatory school. And then, you know, uh, in one of those uh, situations in the, in the midst of that, I met a, a partner, a friend of mine who, who, who got into the pimp gang. He had a girl, he had three girls. One of them name was Dirty Red. And I said, man, you got three bitches. Let me have one of them. He said, which one you want? I said, I want the one that's light bright with pussy candy stripe. They ended up giving me the yellow chick. Her name was Dirty Red. And that's how my career in the game, that's how, you know, the pimping thing began. But, you know, of course, you know, I was young and I was a hustler. So I kept on, you know, doing crazy shit like robbing banks and, you know, robbing jewelry stores and shit like that. You know, so I had a little gangster in me. So I, I never really talked to the pimping like fish take the water until after, you know, I eventually got out of jail. And when I got out of jail, you know, I said, man, I think this is something I want to do because I met a couple of guys in there who had had experience and they had gave me some, some games, some tips on the game. So that inspired me to want to go out there and be in the game. And then, you know, of course, you know, uh, you know, after that, you know, I got a little, took a couple of college courses when I went to prison again, you know, and uh, I uh, 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 took some business courses. So I came out, you know, initially I started hustling, selling dope. You know, that shit didn't work for me. You know, I, I didn't like dealing with dope things, you know. It's just like somebody playing me out my money was just crazy, you know. So uh, that didn't work for me. So I ended up getting deep, knee deep in the game. And I became a legendary pimp. I became Pimp Ken. You know, went to New York, went to Cali, you know, went to D.C., went to all the tracks around the world and built a name for myself. And then um, around 95, I went to a play the ball with the Bishop Don Magic One. That's when I met Ice T, who's my dear friend and business partner today. And from that situation, the next year, 96, HBO came uh, to Chicago. I eventually brought him over to Milwaukee and struck a, a, a lucrative deal with them. And the, the film Pimps Up, Hold Down was created. Thereafter, the Hughes Brothers got in contact with me. Then America Pimp was created. You know, so uh, that began my... Uh, my taste of business. And at that point, I became a consummate businessman, you know, and I just created my own project uh, called Pepology. And I did Best of Both Worlds. I did uh, Ghetto Suites, Executive Suites. You know, I did several independent projects. And then that eventually led me to doing uh, uh, features on album. The first album I featured with Jermaine Dupri that sold 2 million. And I went to Lil John. We sold about 8 million with Lil John. I did two songs for Too Short, that sold a few million. Then I did five albums with Pimp C, five with Pastor Choi. I did uh, songs with Mac 10, you know, 50 Cent. You know, everybody in the industry did work with Puffy and Loom and Nelly. And, you know, that created the mystique of, you know, the the the, uh, the intro outro man, you know, the, uh, right. the, the awkward hip hop. And then from there, you know, uh, I got into real estate. I got into daycares. I became a multimillionaire, bought uh, a mansion in the suburbs, 
raised my kids in the suburbs, you know, sent them all to college and shit, you know, changed my life. And uh, one of my sons, he's on that All American uh, 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 pro uh, film thing. He's done a few films. He's he's very uh, doing very well in California. And then uh, so after that, Pimp C died. When Pimp C died, it kind of hurt my heart. So I kind of backed away from the industry for a minute. And then you know I thought about all the things that Pimp C wanted to do and stuff we talked about by unifying hip hop. You know I know you heard him talk about that before. So I called Ice T, and Ice T was telling me about the Rap Syndicate, you know, and about, you know, uh, the Zulu Nation, and how, you know, they was doing things back in the day. I said, man, I got an idea. I'm gonna start the Hip Hop Fraternity, and it's gonna be an organization of bosses, you know, and each city gonna have their own boss, and we're gonna form it like the United States, you know, each state gonna be a governor in that state from the Hip Hop Fraternity, and the uh, White House would be in Atlanta, which is the Black House, and we would call it you know, uh, the headquarters, and we call it Hip Hop Fraternity, and each uh, a member of that organization would be a licensee. They'd be a DBA doing business as, but they had their own 501C, 50, uh, uh, LLC or 501C3, you know, independent, uh, you know, non profit. Yeah, non profit. You know level. something? Even before we go too deep, because I want to dig deep into, into the Hip Hop Fraternity, but can we go backwards for a second? Yeah. You just gave us a ton to un unpack in a few minutes. So I want to I take this story a little slower because my brother, did, did you like, to you, this is just your life. But you just gave us so much in such a short amount of time that I'll be doing the audience a disservice if we didn't take this thing slow, okay? No, I'm just, I, I know we was going to cover. I was just, you know, it's like an introduction, that's all. <laughs> my brother. Okay, um, so you said you got locked up at what, fourteen years old on tip murder charge? Yeah, and that was with your blood brother. Yeah, my blood, my oldest brother, Kali. Okay, so number one, if you don't mind, what happened? What landed y'all in that situation? And then how'd y'all even beat it? Well, because uh, in Chicago, you have uh, what they call L trains, right? And the third rail is electrifying, you know, it can kill you if you touch it, you know. So it was this white drunk guy, we was in Oak Park, Illinois, and uh, he kind of, you know, approached my brother on some gangster shit, you know, on some nigga shit, because back then they'd call you niggas back then, you know, and my brother pushed him, you know, because he was approaching. So when he pushed him, he was so drunk, he stumbled onto the, to the uh, you know, to the tracks. Fortunately, the train wasn't coming, so he got back up and got on the tracks, but it was a camera there, and there was some white, other white people there who called the police and said that we did all this stuff to them. So the police, they uh, took us to the headquarters, they beat us down, they stomped us, and we were trying to tell them that we was underage, and they was they weren't trying to listen to us, you know what I'm saying? So they sent us straight to the, to the adult jail. Now, we being scared of my father and not want to, you know, convey, you know, who we really was and, you know, stuff like that. My brother just said, man, let's just go with what they what they going with. And maybe they might let us out if we say that we adults and maybe daddy don't have to get us so we can get out. So we lied about our age, you know what I'm saying? Me. And by us lying about our age, that put us in an adult uh, facility with nothing but gang bangers, GDs, vice lords, Latin kings, Spanish cobras, you know, it was the worst jail I've ever been in my life. But we had a, 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 a a decision to make. Do we tell these people who we really are? Do we go home and daddy beat us with the stenture cord, which is how he used to whoop us? Yeah. So we were more afraid of pops than we was of uh, being in there with them gangsters and killers. You know, we were like, anything is better than me, pops, you know. So we know what pops going to do. You know, we had to work our way through that. You know, being that my father was a player and he gave, he laced us with gang. You know, a lot of the guys respected us because they didn't know we was, we were so shy to be young dudes. You know, we had a lot of gang. All my uncles and all of them, you know, we grew up around gang. All my whole family was players, you know. So uh, that kind of went through that. And so what happened was the judge, you know, when he was, uh, when we was going to uh, one of our, our hearings, he was saying like, okay, he's asking the prosecutor, did they intentionally push them over there? Did it, was it intentional? Was it, was it a, 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 a purpose act? And so, uh, the, the, the district attorney said, no, uh, it looked like 
uh, the uh, the person, you know, who who who's making the charges, it seemed like he approached them first, and so the judge said, you know, uh, this is not gonna fly. You know, we you know we might as well dismiss the case. So they did a no process. They didn't dismiss it. They did a no process, meaning that they could bring it up at any time. But you know, we was minor, so we left. And you know, if they even if they would have called us, you know, it would have came up in the system, you know, that they were legally liable, you know. So I guess that's probably why they just didn't pursue it. They probably found out who we really was and found out that we was, we was underage. How, how long was y'all locked up before that? Three months. So you did three months on the inside, and that's where you was actually introduced to some of the pimps on the inside to the pimping game. No, 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 no. That was much years later. You know, it was uh back. When I was 19, I met a guy by the name of Pimpin' Pope, and he was the biggest pimp in Milwaukee. And he was, he had got into this guy by the name of Pimpin' Sam. So Sam jumped on his car, and he shot Sam up off his car, and Sam was, Sam was eventually, he came and paired, whatever they call it. Uh, he paraplegic? Him. Paraplegic, yeah. You know, it's on my mind, I just couldn't say it. So that uh, led him in the cell with me, and so I asked him, I said, you know, Man, you know, I had a bitch when I was 16. I tried my hand at pimping. I said, well, what is this pimping thing really about? So he said, you know, and I said, he said, let me explain to you from this perspective why I'm in jail. I said, okay. He said, well, I had this broad named Juanita. And Juanita, you know, if I took a shit, she'd be there to wipe my ass. He said, if I put a cigarette in my mouth, she's going to fumble three times to light my cigarette. He said, if I, it's my stomach raw, she's going to go and cook me something to eat. He said, I just had her under instruction. He said, and that's how a pimp is supposed to deal with hoes. You know, you keep them under instructions. So he kept talking about instruction, instruction, instruction. He said, but Sam had never encountered a situation where he was a pimp, but he never caught where a bitch was so in pocket, where a bitch did everything that she said. And, you know, so he fell in love with all her, you know, her services, you know, and her humbleness and her bowing downness, you know. But she fell in love with that, and that's what made him want to go to war with Pippin Pope after she chose back up on him because he thought that she loved him, but she didn't love him. You know, she was just doing what she was taught to do as a, a, a woman that's in the game that was under instruction. So he said, Ken, there's no difference between the in-pocket bitch and the out-of-pocket bitch. He said, you treat all bitches the same. You know what I'm saying? So that stuck in my head and I used his philosophy and it made me a legendary successful pimp as he was. So I was basically living vicariously through him, but he was more flamboyant, more, you know, Willie Donamite type. I was more, you know, like a sophisticated Imani, you know, uh, Rolex, you know, more sophisticated type dude. But I, I, I kept his principles and I went to the doctor. I had a, a, a triple bypass. You know, I had all the sympathy removed from my heart. You know what I'm saying? Me? And that was the game that he taught me, that this is a non-sympathetic game to win, you know, and. You know, no matter how beautiful a woman was or no matter how good, the, you know, the love and sex or whatever could be, we never we never looked at that. We only looked at the bottom line, you know, get out there and give me some money. And, you know, that's how I became so strong. You know, I, I credit a lot of the game that I got from him in that sale that made me, you know, the person that I am in the game, you know, because a, a lot of times I could have fell in love with them bras. I could have been like Sam and I could have been, you know, a simp, you know, and and, and, and be in love with these bros and, you know, be be mad when they leave. But when they left, you know, he told me when a bitch leave, give her a Chinese name, one gone, Su Wong, you know? So, you know, that was never the uh, issue with me, you know? And because of that, you know, I got a reputation in the streets for being a solid pimp, you know, and a lot of hoes, you know, that's what they're looking for, solidarity. They're looking for a nigga that ain't gonna be, you know, trying to fuck them and trying to, you know, do all this all the time. And it's gonna check his money and going to be staying on, on, on his business. And that's what my reputation became. Then a lot of the pimp niggas, you know, as I would travel across, across the country, I met other pimps. A lot of them talk slick. So my daddy now was always slick talker. So I was basically born with the slick side of me, you know what I mean? So I would talk a lot of slick shit. You know, niggas, they liked me. You know, I had been in the penitentiary. I was a Moorish American. I was part of the Moorish Science Temple. I was part of the Honorable Noble Drew Ali. So I had a little religious principles and a little, you know, more science with me too. So, you know, I was a leader. So a lot of the guys, the pimp guys, they liked me and we became good friends. And, you know, my name became legendary and all the pimps started respecting me. 
And, uh, you know, that's how I became Pippa Kent after HBO gave me the name. Let me ask you something. Before you became a pimp, did you ever have like a nine to five or was you always on the street in one way, shape or form? Well, one time uh, I was uh, I was looking at my brother. He had a job at this place called Sherlock's Restaurant. And I was looking at him, he was buying clothes and shit, you know. He, you know, he wasn't really making no money, but you know, by that time, maybe a hundred dollars a week. But you know, pants was probably twenty, thirty dollars. But every week he had about two or three pair of pants. He I had to wear his shit. So I said, man, I'm gonna go try working it. So they, they had me as a bus boy and I had to carry the tray. I, I dropped the tray. I said, I'm out this motherfucker. I left my body there, <laughs> left the tray on the ground, everything. I said, fuck this shit, man. I ain't working for nobody. I never had a job again in my life after that. Other, my father, he had uh, uh, after he got out of the game, he opened up a, a junk business, Ivy Junkin, and uh, he used to go get all these pipes. He cut these pipes and shit out of these buildings, and he make a lot of money, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a job. You know, some slick shit he was doing. So he asked me to come to work with him one time, and when he was cutting the pipe, the, the dust from the pipe got in my nose. And I started coughing and I walked out on him, you know, so I just, you know, working you is know, never. You keep saying your father was in the game. What game was he in? Was he was he a pimp? Was it was he in? A, 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 he, was a he was a pimp. He sold heroin. You know, he uh, he was a gambler. He's a professional gambler. So he cheated niggas for a living. He was a pool shark. He was, uh -huh. on you know, he was that kind of nigga, you know. And he had plenty of bitches, you know what I'm saying? Plenty of bitches. My mom and him often fought about women, you know what I'm saying? Me. So that was his thing. You know, my uncle Greasy, they were dope dealers and hustlers. They had cars and Cadillacs with drop tops with, you know, I always seen that lifestyle. I never been without the street side, you know? So Pops, my uncle Greasy was a pimp. You know, they was pimps and players. They had all the pimps and hoes over by a crib. You know, my mom used to play cards with the hoes and shit, you know, and you know, it was just a a, a never-ending, you know, street environment, you know what I'm saying? All the people that came to my house that was my daddy friends eventually, when I got in the game, they became my friends, you know, like old man Jim Dandy, you know, he just died, he died about 89. He was one of my mentors, you know, he taught me how to shoot bad dice, he taught me how to gamble, how to be a player, you know, and finesse and shit, you know? So, you know, I, I was around that shit all my life. You know, you but clearly people, get this thing, honestly. Um, huh? You clearly get this hustling thing, honestly. It's in your you know, DNA. It's yeah, I was born and not sworn. <laughs> there you go. So, I never was a pimp, obviously. How, how do you, like, how do you even approach a woman? Well, you know, to sell her body and bring you the money, because that's one yeah. of the craziest things that I've ever heard. Well, you know, it's the old saying that a pimp can get anybody to be a hoe, and that's the truth. Because pimps, you know, what I'm saying, I mean, most of them come from broken homes. Most of them probably had bad situations when they were kids. You know, in my situation, you know, I was molested by my babysitter, a young lady. She Oh, well, she wasn't a young lady. I don't know how she old. She just looked, she was just a very heavy set, dark skinned sister who molested me. How old were you? I was about three years old. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, my mother, you know, uh, you know, most of us have abandonment issues. You know, like for example, you know, when I was so I was five years old, I was the baby, you know, you know, it's nine of us, you know, so I was the last baby, you know, to about four or five years. And then my mother had another son, which is my brother, Tony. So I feel abandoned. You know what I'm saying? I, I miss my mother's love. You know, that love that you get from your parent, you know, you know, that never, you know, that never uh, disappeared. So when she didn't show me the love no more, I became the class clown. I would act up in school. You know, I didn't allow myself to fall in love with nobody because I didn't want to experience that situation that I experienced with my mother being the baby and, you know, being, you know, a uh, uh, shower with so much love and then abandoned, you know what I mean? So I had abandoned issues and I had attention issues. You know, I wanted the attention that I got when I was a child. So I would act out in school. So I end up being a special ed. They said I was attention deficit, you know what I'm saying? And most young African American men and women go to special ed, ed 
special, I guess they call it special ed, education. Right. You know, they, they have attention deficit. They want, they crave the attention of their mother. So, you know, that and, you know, being molested at a young age, you know, it, it gave me a certain disposition towards women. I didn't know it because 99% of the shit that we do is unconscious. We don't even know why, but it stems from my childhood. You know, so this is one of my early childhood uh, psychosis, you know what I'm saying, I mean, that was ingrained in me that I didn't even know that I was being, you know, uh, literally affected. I didn't know the reason why I was doing the things that I was doing because I missed the attention of my mother. Then one of my brothers, my oldest brother, colleague, you know, he had went, uh, before we even got into all that, he had went into a, a reformatory school for about three months. And my mom used to go see him every day. You know, so, you know, I believe that in some way, a lot of times when I act out, act out, you know, I, initially when I, I wanted, you know, to, to uh, when I went for jail, jail for forgery and I didn't know what I was doing, I, it seemed like I wanted to go to jail. I wanted my mama to come see me every day, but she didn't come and see me like that. My mama never visited me in prison because she's vowed after my oldest brother went to jail, she would never go see one of her children in jail. So I was hoping to get that same love and respect, but I never did. So it made me a cold-hearted person. You know, I did 10 years in prison collectively. So it made me a cold-hearted person, made me desensitized towards men, women, whoever, you know. That's why, you know, if you fuck with me on the streets, I'm going to punish you, seriously, because I didn't give a fuck. You know what I mean? I was just desensitized, you know. And, you know, I mean, I carried a gun, you know what I mean? I was ready. I was with the shit, you know what I'm saying? Uh, You know, bitch, she fuck with me. She got to, you know, get my money. I don't want no love, none of that shit. You know, I don't want to. Go, you're not going to do me like my mother did me. You're not going to leave me hanging. You're not going to make me feel so loved and so appreciated and then abandon me. So I had abandoned issues. You know what I'm saying? Me. And, you know, uh, you don't know you have these things until you get much older. You start studying psychology. You start studying, you know, a uh, 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 psycho, psycho, you know, this the mind, you know, how the mind works. Right. And then, you know, that's what I realized, you know, after many years that that was my problem. You know, and then I, I called my mother at 55, which is about four years ago. I said, Ma, I know why I acted the way I act. He said, why? I said, because the babysitter that you had babysit me, she molested me. And that's why, you know, I was so hard on women. That's why I was so desensitized. That coupled with the fact that I was mad because you didn't come see me while I was in prison. So after I got that out of my chest, you know what I'm saying? That was a, a relief for me, you know, but I, 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 I'm I, one of the few people that figure out why I was a pimp. You know, I was a pimp because of my disposition towards women, you know, being that women, you know, I had bad experience with a woman being molested by a woman. You know, my mother abandoned me, you know, that's, you know, what made me, you know, want to get in the game. You know what I'm saying? Me? And then, you know, once you get in the game, you know what I'm saying? Me, you become manipulative. And you become desensitized. And so you don't care how you manipulate this woman. You don't care how you finesse her. You got, you know, it's all type of different ways. You sit back and you think of ways how I'm going to turn this broad out. And then once you get in the game, you realize that, damn, the women have been raped too. They have issues of abandonment as well. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so they want attention. So a lot of times, you know, to get their attention, they feel, you know, like they use their body to get attention. You know, tricks, you know, sweat women, you know, that's a tr- attention. They go to strip clubs, they throw money on these girls, they, they get butt naked for attention. You know, so everybody wants attention. That's the problem. All of us looking for attention, the male and the female. You know, something happened within our psychosis of being children. Because everything, anything that happened to you, whatever happened to you in life, it, it stemmed from your childhood. You might not know that. So, you know, so that being said, you know, a lot of times women would pay men as a scapegoat because it's easy to pay somebody and blame them for their disposition and say, you know, I'm doing it because the pimp want me to do it. Then they say, hmm, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just a freaky bitch. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and I'm mad at my uncle because he raped me. I'm mad at my pops because he raped me. I'm mad because my brother never run a train on me and we played house and we had sex, you know, and it was incest, you know, and, 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 and my virginity was taken. I can never say that, you know, I had a, you know, a virgin marriage, you know what I'm saying, that I, you know, I never had sex with, my virginity was taken, all this stuff, you know, it creates the pimp and whole lifestyle. Three, two psychotic motherfuckers, you know what I'm saying, you know, they've been through all type of shit, you know, they have all type of issues that are psychologically ingrained, and, you know, and you talk to hoes, you talk to pimps, and you find out that this is the norm. You know, most hoes been molested. Most hoes 
men rape. You know, most hoes, you know, they use their body as a weapon. They learn at a very young age that my daddy want to have sex with me. He'd give me cookies if I have sex with him. You know, my uncle, you know what I'm saying? He'd give me money to have sex with me. You know what I mean? Then they, they realize the power of the pussy, you know, at a very young age. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, even in the square world, you know, you might never been a pimp, but you can have women that use pussy to try to manipulate you. You know what I'm saying? But some women just use it to the extremes and that's what hoes do. You know what I'm saying? You got lawyers, you know, who, you know, know the value of their pussy. You got doctors who are professional women that know the value of their pussy and they use it against men. Sometimes when a woman get mad, the first thing she do is she she walk out the house and she don't give you no pussy for a minute, right? Because the pussy is that powerful. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, damn, man, she acting crazy. And that's why men go cheap. Because see, one thing about a man, and women know this, that in between his, his penis is two things called testicles. You know, and these testicles got over five, half a billion sperms in them. And them sperms want to get out. They want to release. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so men like to release. Men like to have sex. But most women, you know, when they say, and this is how you get the tricking in the pimping. This is how the, the tricks come out. Most women say, my husband got a problem. You know, he's a sex maniac. All he want to do is have fucking sex. He's a fucking, I'm tired of having sex because women look at sex different than men. Women look at, women look for affection. You know, they look for attention. They want to be held. You know what I'm saying? They want to go out to the movie. Men just want to release. You know what I'm saying? Because he got so much sperm housed in his, his in his testicles. So the woman said he's a sex maniac. He's a nipple. And they go have marriage counseling. They go to the psychiatrist. And she said, what is the problem? All he want to do is have sex. She said, is that his problem? And, and the woman said, yeah. And the psychiatrist said, that's my problem, too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know we, we got the same problem. And that problem is what creates tricking. And, and, and women understand that. Women understand that, you know, that men like to release. And they know, you know, when they walk through the mall, he could be with his wife. And he, they can be pushing the baby in the stroller. He gonna do this. Mm, mm. Me to butt, you know what I'm saying? And the women know their power. So some women, you know, they could be perfectly square. They still gonna charge you to take them to the steakhouse. They're gonna charge you to take them to the movie. You might give a woman two thousand dollars worth of courtship, you know, before you even get the pussy. That's another form of a, a, a horn. You know, the mother tell the, the daughter, "Hey, look." Uh, when you get older, marry your rich man. That's hoeing. You know, some uh, some 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 mothers say, "Look, that's a cute guy right there. Talk to him." Really, that guy is her boss's son. She's trying to get a better position. She's trying to get a promotion. So she's sticking her son on the, her boss's. Uh, she's sticking her daughter on her on her boss's son, and now she's fucking him. And she's getting benefits from that. So pimping is not just, you know, the pimping the hoe. Pimping goes on 24-7. Horn going on 24-7. You know, you got women that go to the church. You know, they become the pastor's assistant. Next thing you know, you know what I'm saying, me, you know, the pastor taking care of them. You know what I'm saying? He's he's paying for pussy. You know what I'm saying, me? But they won't call it pimping. You know what I'm saying? They're going to just like, you know, the pastor just want to release. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask you something. Because I'm listening to you um, and you breaking this thing all the way down. When you was out there doing what you was doing, did you go after the women or did they find you? Well, you know, it's that's what it says. I'm going to get chose with my mouth closed. See, pimps get cho chose. You know, when, once you're in the game, you know, a woman can be with you. And if you beat her up or she don't like you, she can come choose up on me. That's the culture. But the squares don't know that this going. People think it's all about. There are a few uh, selected cases where, you know, you got guys that get underage girls where guys manipulate women or guys human trafficking, as they want to call it. There are some incidents of human traffic. But 99 percent of the women that's horn, they're doing it by choice, not by force. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, think about it like this. If a bitch got with me and she was paying me. And I said, go to work. She go all the way out of my house. Say, what state you live in? What state? New you York. Live in? So, New York. Okay, say, say you live in Harlem, right? Mm -hmm. But the track is on 11th Avenue in Manhattan. So she get on the L, she get on the train, she go all the way to Manhattan. 
she see about nine police officers, about five uh, MTMs, you know, uh, 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 medical. Uh, workers, yeah. yeah, and she don't ask neither one of them to save me from the pen van. But she go and she get the money and she held the money in her hand first. Then she take it home and give it to a pimp. You have to say, how did she get all the way from Manhattan all the way back to Harlem to give you that money? You know what I'm saying? I mean, why did she stop a police officer or a social worker or, you know, a pastor? Somebody say, look, this guy is forcing me into prostitution because that ain't how the game go. It's by choice, by not by force. She's willingly giving her money because she had multiple opportunities to take that four or $500 that she might have made that night and go get her apartment and move to another section of the city and start hoeing over there. You know what I'm saying? But generally what happened, the minute she get mad with me, you would think that she would quit after she leave me. No, she go choose up on another pimp. So now she's being pimped by another pimp and the system say she's being manipulated. I think, you know, it's, it's more so, you know, she's giving the man the money because she don't want to look like she's a nymphomaniac. You know, I'm not crazy, but I'm giving my money to this guy. He's the reason why I'm doing it. No, that's not, he's not the reason why you're doing it because you have multiple opportunities to get out the game but you're still in the game. And some of them be in the game 10 to 15 years. You can't tell me somebody makes anybody do anything for that multiple period of time, you know? So, uh, you know, most of the cases, you know, end of life. Now, every now and then, you know, you might pull up in a Rolls Royce, you know, you fly, you got the Rolex on, and a woman might be in, you know, she might be excited by that and say, now, who is you? You might have a couple of quick lines. What's up, mom? You so fine. Your mom said that trip is you like you need to be in Look Magazine. What's up, gorgeous? Come on, can I take you out to get you something to eat, baby? I just want to show you better ways of brighter days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you got to, yeah, come on, baby. So what you want to do? You want to go to this spell okay, Huh? Order what you want. You know, you get it there. You know, you tell us, yeah, you know, have you, you know, ever think about getting some money? Getting some money, how? You know, just, you know, uh, checking out. You know, I got some older guys that got some, you know, some, 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 some money and they be lonely. You know, you can make a quick five, six thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying? I mean, she said, where? You don't know nobody can do that. I said, yes, I do. You must be a pimp. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can call me that. You know what I'm saying? But I'm I'm going to put you in a better life. So I'm going to make you, I'm going to get you out this project. You know, we just talking shit, right? The next thing you know, I go get one of my partners, one of my OGs. I give them 500 I say, man, you know, have, have sex with this bra for 500 Now she's turned out. She got that 500 I let her keep that 500 you know, I'm turning it out. So now she's taking that 500 and she's going shopping. She said, do you know how I get some more than 500 is that? You know I said? Yeah, I do. But guess what? You know what I'm saying? I mean, since I'm giving you the game and I'm showing you, you know, how the game go and I'm giving you guidance and inspiration and motivation, check this out. You know, why don't you just let me handle the money? Let me control everything. I'm going to buy you all your clothes. I'm going to buy you everything. And we're going to have a business. You know what I'm saying? I mean, at this point, you know what I'm saying? I mean, she's going to agree because she's going to want to keep making money. And then after a while, she gets in the culture and she realizes, oh, this is how it go. All the hoes is giving their money to the pimps. You know, you know, the pimps control the money. You know what I'm saying? The pimps buy the clothes. The pimps buy the wigs. I had a one pimp partner named Ron. He's out of Dallas. He has 17 white bitches. He told all his hoes to add up all the money that they spend on a monthly basis. They were spending 42000 a day. A month. How much? Forty-two thousand dollars a month on makeup, hair, clothes, apartments, and all of that. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, so you know he was making about a hundred thousand a month. You know, so he's clearing about about fifty-seven, fifty-eight thousand dollars in profit. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, all of them was in agreement. Seventeen beautiful blonde white bitches. You know what I'm saying? All American. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but you know, it was fun to them. You know, they wanted, they was winning. You know, they was winning the best of the best. They didn't need him. If they would have not used him, they would have had a hundred thousand dollars in profit. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. That fifty thousand they got, but why did they do that? It's the same reason why, you know, people, like I said, have abandonment issues, you know, uh socialization issues, you know, socialization meaning that that's the reason why gangs are formed because they want a family structure. You know, some of them, you know, come from broken homes. Some of them was orphans. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of reasons that the society don't speak on and the psychiatrists and the sociologists don't speak on when it comes to the pimp. 
because it's embarrassing because most of them are the tricks. You, you know, you just educated me on something. I thought that it was a split. Um, maybe the girls take home 40%, the pimp take home 60%. Are you saying that the average pimp take all the money and just pay your bills? But let me give you the caveat to that, right? Uh -huh. Say for instance, you got five bitches, right? And all of them go to work. And they all go to work that night. And when they go to work, as soon as they hit the track, the uh, fights pick them up, take them to jail. All of them got a $5,000 bail. That come out of your pocket. If you got five girls and only one girl break that night and she make money, that come out of your pocket. It ain't all profitable. There's going to be, it's just like in any business, you know, it's, it's, it's peaks and valleys. So sometimes, you know, you can have five or six girls, but they all might not make money. You know, the police might be sweating the track. The track might be hot. So how are you going to make money if ain't no money to be made? So sometimes, you know, they'll give you all the money, you know what I'm saying, but you can't pay half the bail. You got to pay all the bail. If they gave me 50% of the money, then I'm only going to pay 50% of your bail. So how you gonna get out of jail? You know what I'm saying? So you know it's best that you give me all the money. So if your bail five thousand, I don't. I'm not gonna just pay twenty five hundred of it. You got your twenty five hundred. Of course you don't got your twenty five hundred. You're in jail. So, but if I, if we got an agreement that I take care of all the bills when you pay that, when you go to jail for that five thousand, if I don't have five thousand that you made, I'm gonna take five thousand out of some, some of the money that the other girls made. So we're gonna be robbing Peter to pay Paul. You know what I'm saying, me? And, you know, when we, when we go out to dinner, we all going to eat steak. You know what I'm saying, me? You know, if you ain't made steak money, you should be eating a, 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 a double stack from Wendy's. But, you know what I'm saying, me? Because, you know what I'm saying, me? We're a family, and because we're putting all the money in one pot, then, you know, we're going we gonna, we gonna to take the good with the bad. You know, you had a good day, you had a bad day. You know what I'm saying, me? But your good days and your good days add up to us a good day. And your bad days, you know what I'm saying, me, is going to be compensated by her good days. Is it against the rules or against your rules to actually sleep with your women? Well, if you're in the game, who else are you going to sleep with? You ain't for to sleep with a square because the object of the game is, you know, Pim say, you know, it's purse first and ass last. If you think I'm handsome, pay my ransom. If I'm going to take a chance, give me my money in advance meaning that you're not sleeping with absolutely no square bitches whatsoever. You're not going to sleep with a woman that's not a prostitute because you're in that game. To you, it seems unusual. But if you look at the ratio of prostitutes catching AIDS or getting disease, it's way slimmer than the people that's in the square world who's getting AIDS and getting BD and, and end up the clinic every day because they're using protection and you're using protection. So it's two layers of protection. Whereas in a square relationship, you may be the uh, the good husband at home, but you out fucking all the bitches in the club. So you're making it, you making your woman vulnerable. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so you know, your woman, you know, or fucking all the men, you know, and, and going to gym, telling you she's going to gym or going to Walmart when there's a a a a, a, a holiday inn right next to Walmart. You think she at Walmart? She really at the Holiday Inn with a friend. You know what I'm saying? Fucking on you, cheating on you. You know what I'm saying? But she's not using no protection. Well, with a prostitute, she assumes that everybody that she has sex with has got a disease. So she got to protect herself. She used two condoms. And then when you come home, she come home to you, you assume that, you know, maybe a condom broke or maybe, you know, she might not, you know, protect herself. So you're using a condom. You know what I'm saying? So you're always protecting yourself. But, you know, just like you and just like anybody else, the pimp got to release too. So the only the only girls you mess with as a pimp is prostitutes. Well, that's only that's the only girls you're supposed to mess with. Now you will mess with a square girl if you're trying to enter into your stable. Like I might meet a girl, for example, she's from the project. What where you from? What part of New York? Bronx. So you from the Bronx. You meet a chick in the Bronx, she's a freak, right? Everybody down in her, but she ain't getting no money. But she's a square. She ain't no prostitute. So you're going to try to get up under her and talk to her and you're going to mess with her. You're going to say, look, all this sex that you have and you're making absolutely no money. Just imagine you was getting paid for that. In that instance, you have to deal with her because you're trying to flip her. You know what I'm saying? 
you know, but if you was in the game and you had seven or eight girls and they found out that you was messing with a square girl and they were paying you, they're going to go choose up on the next pimp because they're going to consider you as being a phony. So, so that's a violation in that world. Yeah, yeah, that's a violation if you get caught. Oh. There's guys who have uh, wives and have other situations and stuff like that that they deal with, you know. And, you know, me, when I was in the game, I was 100, you know what I mean? I didn't want to mix it. I didn't want to be, you know, labeled as that. You know what I mean? I wanted to be 100. I wanted, you know, I chose the lifestyle, so I wanted to be a perfectionist a perfection in the game. So I I, I, I kind of, you know, kept it 100. And I didn't mess with no square bras, you know, and nothing like that. You know, when I was in the game, I was just trying to, you know, you know, do it the best I can. So on average, how, how long does a prostitute stay with a pimp? Well, generally, it can it go anywhere from a day to four years. The average that, you know, like I had some women, most women that I deal with, they usually stay about four years. After four years, depending on their age, they burnt out. Because, you know, that's a lot of, you know, interaction with people and a lot of, you know, rejection because everybody don't want to deal with a prostitute. So they got to deal with rejection. They got to deal with, you know, uh, the human elements and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, generally they might stay four years. Every now and then you see a prostitute stay with a guy for 10 or 15 years or something like that. But that's rare. So when you say they burnt out, they lead a game all together or do they move from one pimp to another pimp? Well, it's just like the NBA, but it's the NPA, the National Pimp Association. You know what I'm saying? I mean, a bra might, you know, you know, she might be in the game and, you know, she might just say, you know, I'm, I can't do this no more. You know, or she might be in the game for 30 days and say the same for me. So ain't no, uh, the book on what a bra going to do ain't been written yet. Nobody knows that question. Got you. Got you. OK. I know you you did this thing and, and you you played it by the rules. But did you ever find yourself personally falling in love with one of your prostitutes? Never. Because you remember Never. when I told you I was in jail with the dude, Pip and Pope? Mm -hmm. He taught me early on in the game that, you know, ain't no love in this shit. Love is like a four letter word, like fucking shit. So fuck that shit. You know what I mean? You know, we don't fall in love. You can't, how am I fall in love with somebody that's going and, 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 you know, getting, you know, dick all day, you know, sucking on dick all day. You know what I mean? I'm not going to fall in love with her because I know she ain't in love with me. If she's in love with me. She won't be out there selling her body. Now, you got love for the game. You know, I got love for the game. You know, we in the game. I love the game that I'm in. But as far as me being in love with a bra, that's impossible. And any nigga who tried or say he do it, it is not going to work because you're going to always be in the back of your mind. Like this bro, you know, she out here, you know, she having a lot of fun. She getting a lot of money. She, she sleep with a lot of men. You know what I mean? And, you know, then she coming home. She's telling she she love you. No, you can't possibly love me if you sleep with the next nigga. You know what I mean? It just, you know, if your wife said, baby, I love you. And she fucked every nigga in the Bronx, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, would you love her? Be honest. Would you love her? No, absolutely not. Not me. Okay. So to put yourself in the pimp position, you know what I'm saying? That's why he can go from hole to hole, because he ain't finna be, you know, caught up on that bullshit. You know, that love ain't even ain't no love in the game. Your partner, motherfucker, start at your feet, end up at your throat. You know what I'm saying? Me, the game is cutthroat. You know what I'm saying? Motherfuckers ain't, you know, ain't playing no game. You know, when I'm out there, you know, in the streets, you know what I'm saying? Me, you know, I'm I'm in full game mode. You know what I'm saying? I'm putting pressure on niggas. You know what I'm saying? Me, I'm beating niggas to the punch. I'm going to win the war before I even go into the battle. I come out to destroy niggas. You know what I'm saying? I come out to knock your bitch. I come out to take you out the game. Nigga, you in my way. Ain't but one number, you know, one spot at the top. Number one, I want that spot. You know? So let's let's go to war, nigga. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you try to take my bitch, I'm gonna take your bitch. But if I get your bitch, I'm gonna blow your fuse and put your bitch up some, under some new rules. You know what I'm saying? I Me mean, and I'm gonna serve you the game. You know what I'm saying? That's how the, the cutthroat game is. And then a bra, you know, she could be laying up with you, tell you she love you. I ain't gonna never leave you. And she said, I gotta go see my mama. You never see her again. Or she can, you can, y'all can have an argument. She can be walking up and down the track, and here come pretty boy Roy. You know what I'm saying? Me with the brand new Rolls Royce, talking good, smiling, saying the shit she want to hear. She already upset with you. 
Next thing she jumps in the car with him, you get a phone call from him and say, man, I'm just going to show you new, blow your fuse, let you know this bitch is up under some new rules. You know what I'm saying? like, what? This bitch just told me she loved me. So after a while, <laughs> you become desensitized to that and you understand it's just like a job, like the fireman. You think he, you know, give a fuck about killing you? I mean, the police department, you think you, you think he's, if you have a gun, you think he give a fuck about killing you? He's going to kill you because that's his job. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he don't go out with the intention to kill nobody, but if you up a gun on that motherfucker, he's going to kill you. Or if you got a gun on somebody else, he's going to kill you. That's what the training is. Well, the game trained you to be desensitized. Wow. You know, you talked about that um, pimp down in, um, I think it was Houston, Texas. And you said he had 19 white women. At your peak, how many Dallas, women did you have? 17. I had 16. Okay, and he was in Dallas. Time. So I normally kept by eight, but how I got to the 16, I was in uh, Indiana. I met this broad named Sensation. She was dancing at this club called Pure Passion. So uh, I went up in there, and she had eight wife-in-laws. Those are the other girls that belonged to the other pimp. So when I took her, the whole stable came with her, and that's how I got up to 16 bras. Okay, so, and I know it's going to sound like a stupid question, but do 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 pimps have assistants like like managing, you know, sixteen people? That ain't an easy job. Like you can go to a regular corporation and well, you, you got the CEO. Well, 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 what you do? The strategy to that is to keep them busy. You know what I'm saying? So if you have a program, and if you really want to manage sixteen bitches, right? Mm -hmm. You know that at nine o'clock, each one of them bitches need to be out the door. And they're not allowed to come back in until six or seven in the morning. So when they come in, you can imagine they tired as fuck, right? So you got 16 bitches laying around, but they all sleep. By the time they wake up around about seven, eight, they get something to eat, they wash, take a shower, then they back to work. So you don't, that's how you manage it by not managing it. You know what I'm saying? Keeping them busy. You know what I mean? Because an idle mind with a hoe is really the devil workshop. You can't really sit down and have, a one-on-one -on -one with a hoe. You know what I'm saying? You want to keep her busy. She got to be work, work, work until that pussy hole squirt. Yeah, speaking of that, is it any days off for these women? Only day they get off is when they run off. So you telling me your women was working seven days a week straight? That's, that's what they want. If you don't do that, they don't respect you. Are you serious? <laughs> Yeah, man, hoes is more, y'all always interview the pimps, interview some of these hoes. Hoes are most, some of the most ruthless motherfuckers on the planet. You got to remember one thing about a bitch, she talked to thousands of niggas in the course of her career. You might talk to 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 bitches. She getting game from lawyers and doctors and all kind of motherfuckers. She hearing all kind of shit. You know what I'm saying, me? She get the game before you get the game. She's choosing other pimps. She didn't been with maybe four or five different pimps. So she got game on all different levels. So when a woman see you and you try to cupcake her, she going to first thing she going to say, daddy, why is you acting like a square? I can go get this for one of my tricks. You see what I'm saying? Mm. And she feel more comfortable, you know, being with a trick and being lovey-dovey with a trick than lovey-dovey with a pimp. Because if she see a pimp being lovey-dovey, she's going to say he's a buster. You know, he, weak, he a weak pimp. And people don't know that part about the game. It seems like it's the opposite. You know, ain't no love in this shit. It's, it's, it's a business, you know what I'm saying? Everybody hell in their business. And if you're lucky enough to be somebody that's astute in the game and know how the business go, you're going to be very prosperous. But if you thinking that this your girlfriend and this somebody that you know whatever, then, you know what I mean, you're sadly mistaken. You're going to run into a lot of bricks and uh, forks in the road because hoes do not play. Hoes are ruthless. You know, hoes know way more than the pimps. They hear way more gain than you hear. They're getting gains from lawyers, from doctors, from police officers, from other hoes, you know. You only talk to that one bitch. Yo, this is so crazy. And, and you are breaking down the psychology of of the game it ain't just the game itself but it's how the pimps think how the prostitutes think i would have never thought in a million years that they don't want a day off 
if if you if you are treating them um a little better than the next man treat them, they looking at you like you not on your game. That's crazy think about, to me. Think about it, New York. Take it for example. When she go on the date, right? It's Dr. So and so, right? Mm-hmm. It's attorney so and so, right? It's businessman so and so. What is he doing? He's coming out of thousands of dollars. He's buying her food. He's buying her clothing. He's treating her extremely well, right? Uh-huh. She's getting all of her treatment and all the sex she wants in her job. She's if she if she likes it, she's in whole heaven, right? So then you come home and you the op you the exact same as these guys. You're loving, you're caring, you know. What I mean, you're giving, you know, you you know, you, you're romantic. She's gonna look at you how she look at him. So when she comes to the door, the first thing I'm gonna tell her is wash the trick up off your ass, bitch. You know what I'm saying? You're in pimp domain. To get her out of the psychology of her day-to-day activities of being a prostitute. She can't look at me in the same way she look at the trick. Therefore, she won't give me the money. I, it have to be something, some kind of uh, 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 dichotomy or some kind of separation line that separate me from the trick. So my behavior have to be totally opposite of the, the trick. It's weird, but that's the way it got to go. If I act like a trick, then she gonna treat me like one. See, when she see me, she can't see a T on my forehead. She got to see a P. Got you. Wow. You know, I mean, this, this is a lot right here. Um, the, the, the whole, you know, you spoke early in the conversation about all of the rappers that you work with. And I remember in the 90s, you know, rap, it really embraced that pimp culture. And that's when the world started to know about people like yourself and the Bishop Don Wands of the world. Did y'all used to look at all the rappers, you know, running around and talking that pimp talk and laugh at them? Well, you know, actually, we use them as a marketing strategy. Because you got to remember, we had pimps up, holes down. And that's how uh-huh. everybody got in tune with us. Nobody knew the culture until after pimps up, holes down, American pimp. So now the rappers became a marketing tool because they're allowing us to speak to their demographics, millions of people. You know, and that translated into players balls. That translated into, you know, uh, 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 parties that we threw. You know, that translated into movies and other stuff we did. So, you know, they be like 50 Cent. Uh, I did a PIMP video. I said, yep. Pepper King said, don't down them crown. I could have said Coca-Cola said don't Donald Trump. I could have said Pepsi said don't Donald Trump. But I said Pippa King said don't Trump. And that video right now is at 800 million. 800 million people heard me, almost a billion people heard me say, you know, Pippa King said don't Donald Trump. So that was a, mar- a massive marketing tool for me. You know, I got on Lil John. It's 8 million people heard me say my shit on Lil John. 2 million on, on, uh, on uh, so, you know, Pips are smart. As you know, as 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 much as people want to say we just you know deal with women, you know we looking at it, you know Bishop Don Juan, all this we looking at it, man. Let's let's get let's fuck these young niggas. They got the platform, they got MTV, they got BET. This is a way for us to market ourselves, you know. And we did just that. We market ourselves, and even to this day, you know, people giving me five thousand dollars just to come to a players' ball because you know of the things we did back in the day. You know, we built a brand you know, for the game. And that brand is still, you know, for some of us working. So so when you saw the opportunity, and when I say you, I'm talking about all the pimps out there, saw the opportunity to use these rappers as kind of a marketing tool for what y'all was doing. Was y'all thinking in terms of- I was the one who initiated. Nobody was doing it prior to me, but sir, for a brother named Sir Captain. But I actually turned it into a strategy, a marketing tool, you know, and I knew- you know, just from, like, I gave you the best example I can give you. I said, Pippa Kidd said, don't Donald Trump. I could have said Coca-Cola. So if you see Coca-Cola, Vitamin Water, Beast by Dre, you know, Ciroc, you know, all these people paying these artists multiple millions of dollars to endorse them, why would I be naive and say they need to endorse me if I'm going to promote and push my product as well? You got to remember online, I had a pimp college too at that time. And uh, you know, uh Pippa Ken Pimp College. So I was selling pimp classes online, you know what I'm saying? I mean, through my website, www.pippakin.net. 
and I made twenty dollars a a a a a sign up. So I had millions of people signing up. I was making, I was buying mansions off these niggas. You know what I'm saying? But I said on every album, if you go listen, I said www.pivotgear.net, sell a bitch pussy to a drip job wet. That was my favorite saying. I created that as a marketing tactic to get people to go over to the website and shop with me. So it wasn't just me saying it. It was a a, a, a method to the madness. It was rhyme to the reason. You know, you have been really, really embraced by the hip hop community. And you've been on so many records. I mean, we can't even, you spoke about some of the people. I know you don't work with the Lil Johns of the world, Jermaine Dupree, Pastor Troy, obviously, um, rest in peace, Pimp C, 50 Cent, to name a few. After a while, was they calling you or did you have to reach out to them? Because you was doing intros, you was doing outros. Everybody called me. You know, after Jermaine Dupree, he came up to me, you know, but it all, let's not, let's be, let's backtrack. It didn't start from there. It started from Pimps Up, Hold Down. If you go look at Pimps Up, Hold Down, I'm on there said, barbecue bill, dude, let your next move be your best move. And I say, I got more game than Van Cannon got poker to be. And I got more flavors down there. I don't need you to let the welfare bitch, bitch, you can't give me no scissors, keep it distant. I got to beat on my Peter, bitch, the long state. So I'm talking rapping. I'm speaking bars then. So they always had an appetite. Man, I want to get that dude on my album, just like they want to get P.D. Kirkland on their album. They want to get other people in their videos, you know, because that represents the culture, you know, and I was the epitome of culture. I was the, I was modeling for Murray shoes. You got to remember, I was a model for Murray. I was in every magazine, you know, uh, it, uh, Pips Up, Hold Down had a billion views. So these guys were fans before they even met me. You know, it's just when I made myself accessible, the phone calls started coming in profusely. And everybody wanted to work with Pippa Ken. 50 Cent paid me to be in PIMP video. You know, uh, all I get publishing for all, all of these songs I've been on. So people seeking me out, you know what I'm saying? They they pers- pers- pursuing me now because, you know, I'm then I got independent people. I'm going to get 5,000 over here, 5,000. I've been on over 300 uh, independent albums. You know what I'm saying? I became yeah. an icon in that fashion. That's why, you know, we can do the things that we're doing today. Wow. You know, we spoke about Pimps Up, Holes Down a couple of times in this conversation. How'd you even get involved with Pimps Up, Holes Down? Uh, like I said, in 96, I went to Chicago to a players ball and I was talking the same shit I was talking now. And they wanted to uh, film me. I said, come to Milwaukee. I had a clothing store. When they came to Milwaukee, I negotiated with them. I negotiated that the film would end with me, that I would get my name on the credits and that they would pay me more than they paid everybody else. And that's what happened. Wow. You, so you made more than the Bishop Don Juan in that, in, a, in that film? I made more than everybody. I was a consultant. All of those parties, if you look at them, those are Milwaukee parties. Those are my parties. So I charge $100 to get in a party. I charge $2,500 for the table. So I made sometimes, and some of the parties I did, I made in excess to 100000 just from the party. But HO, HBO paid for everything. Okay, see, I didn't realize that all them parties was out in Milwaukee. Like, I remember the film now, very some well. Some of them was in Chicago, but, you know, if you look at the parties with me, the one in Pencil Holes Down in the American Cup, those are my parties where I give Scorpio the trophy. That's in Milwaukee. You know, when, they, when the limousines pull up and all that bishop in the back of the limo, that's all in Milwaukee. That's my hometown. Gotcha. You know, some of the scenes were shot in Chicago. The Vegas scene, that was my party. I got paid for that party. Got you, got you. Okay, so it's 2023 now. Um, you got a long legacy in this game, obviously, and you breaking down just a small portion for us. Right. Is, is the pimping game as you knew it? Is it dead? You it's know, dead. you got. Go, hey, go ahead. It's dead. It's dead. It's, you know, the game is dead. You know, women are way more smarter. Like you know, you got to remember prior to pimp, so hold out American pimp. Wasn't no pimps on the TV. Wasn't no YouTube. So the, the, the first relationship or the first encounter with a pimp for most women was in real life. And, you know, the catch it come before the hanging. Before they know it, you know, they turned out. You know, now they could go in there. They could watch Pippi Ken all day. They could watch Bishop. They could look at this to all the pimps. So they could get the game before they even get with the pimp. So and if you are a dude that got a little game and if you ain't as sharp as a butcher knife, she gonna be like, I already know that. Get out of here. You ain't you can't teach me nothing. 
you know what I'm saying? I mean, so the game has been distorted with books. It's a whole bunch of things that, you know, fuck the game up now. And then these women, you know, they got smartphones, meaning that they could do OnlyFans. They could go sit up in the Hyatt, you know, where it's a great protection at, and they can bring their tricks up there. They don't need a pimp to protect them like when they was on the track. They ain't got to worry about other pimps sweating them and other hoes say, get off the track if you're in with a pimp. Because now they got freelance, you know what I'm saying? They freelance, you know, and they're doing their own thing. And, you know, I mean, unless a woman really like a guy and it's, it's very seldom and she just really into him, you know, she probably keep the money herself. Now, and these women smart, they can give a dude, you know, they can call, they can meet a dude at the club and they can be partying. And say, yeah, we used to, oh, I bet the Hyatt. She can smoke weed with him, you know, he gonna fuck the shit out of it for nothing. He ain't gonna ask for no money, but she's a prostitute. He don't even know she's a prostitute because she's not enunciating that she's a prostitute. But she got enough money to buy, you know, an ounce, a zip of, you know, some zope, you know what I mean? And get this dude hot. They could pop some X pills. And, you know, he just think he having fun. But if she was with a pimp, she couldn't do that. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's deep, you know. She can go buy her own Rolls Rovers and all that shit now. She don't need a man to, you know, say, I can get you these things. You know, the time has changed. And then the guys, you know, a lot of them don't have the game because a lot of things happen, you know. A lot of things happen, you know. What happened was, you know, uh, 1985, you had the, uh, the new sentencing laws. You know what I'm saying? You had the crack laws. And what they did is, you know, a lot of brothers and sisters, you know, watched New Jack City and uh, Scarface. And what they did, that created a culture of drug dealers. You know, we all wanted to be Scarface. We all wanted to be Nina Brown. But we didn't pay attention to the new laws, you know, the 85% laws with the feds. We didn't understand the trigger lock. We didn't understand the three strike laws. So a lot of this created mass incarceration. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, America is 5% of the population, but 25% of the world's incarceration. Then you go back to uh, 1978, you had like 280,000 people in prison. Today, you got 2.5 million people in prison and 51% of them are African American. So that brought a lot of fathers out of the hood, you know, a lot of fathers out the home. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's nobody to discipline. So a lot of these young men were raised up under femininity. You know what I'm saying? They've been raised by a woman. So they have a lot of feminine characteristics, you know what I'm saying? I mean, so a lot of times they act more bitchy than the bitch. You know what I'm saying? I mean, a lot of them, you know, they weaker than a woman. You know, so how can a, a dude with bitch tendencies tell a bitch to do anything when she can see that because she's a woman? You know, you know, when when average dude when to date, when he, you know, when he at home, his mama's in the mirror looking at her butt, you know, fixing her hair, putting her eyelashes on. So this is the image that he sees. You know, kids, I learned, you know, most of the things we learn we do, as children, we learn from imagery, right? So, you know what I'm saying? That imagery is not a good imagery for a male uh, a, a child, you know, that's going to grow up to be a man. And that's why you have a lot of homosexuality in our community, not by, you know, people saying they're born homosexuals, because, you know, when you create a lot of feminine characteristics, you can create this notion in your head of this psychosis that, you know, I was born a woman. You no, know, but no, you was raised by a woman, so you took a lot of woman characteristics. And then you got predators out there who would prey on those guys who have feminine characteristics, you know, who switch like their mama or act kind of feminine, right? And they uh, seduce them, you know, and generally like Tyler Perry said, he was seduced. He said he was seduced. He said a man sucked his penis. That was his first ejaculation. That's his first experience with sex. So he started to like it because he didn't know a woman's side of it. You know what I'm saying? He only had a male side of it. And that can lead men into homosexuality. Or it could be, you know, a uh, different effect. It could have an adverse effect. It could be, you know, in order to be a man, I got to kill eight, nine dudes. You know what I'm saying? I got to, I got to fight. You know, I got to, you know, masculinity. You know, it's a thing they call uh, 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 Something about masculinity, you know. What the toxic masculinity? Toxic masculinity, right? Mm -hmm. They talk about toxic mas. It, there's no such thing as toxic ma masculinity. Masculinity and toxic don't go together. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you can't even call it toxic masculinity. Masculinity mean you know raising your children. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know teaching your children you know certain skill sets. You know you got nurture versus nature. You know a, a father nurtures his child. A mother nurtures her, their child. 
So, you know, certain characteristics, you know, what makes the, the lion, you know, the king of the jungle is not the fact that, you know, he's a lion, you know, or that he's ferocious or he's notorious because he said, when he roared, that roar, let everybody know that he's the king. When your father said, boy, shit your ass down. That Adam apple in the middle of his throat creates the fear in the child to let the child know that the feminine voice that his mother portrayed versus the masculine voice that his father portrayed is actually, you know, the difference between authority. You know, the other voice is more authoritarian. So, you know, this is absent, you know, and this is how you create a lot of the ills and problems in our society today. And then you even look at, you know, mass incarceration, you know, CCA, Correctional Corporation of America. Now, the Correctional Corporation of America is on the stock exchange. You know, it's privatized prison. You know, so if you got hotels, you got to have occupants. Am I right? So that's what, you, that's what you see, mass incarceration. And that's where you see a lot of the problems in our society. And that's why you see a lot of women not respecting men. Somebody asked me a question. What's the problem with why women don't respect black men? It ain't that women don't respect black, black men. Society don't respect black men. When you look at the, the evening news, there's some brother in handcuffs. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when you look at all the power positions, you know, you look at a European man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when you look at, you know, some of the jobs that is given to African Americans, they're given to African American women. So man is black man is being continuously and uh, 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 psychologically through social engineering being minimized. You know, he's being minimized and he's being less of a factor because it's all boiled down to genetic annihilation and genetic survival. When you look at it genetically, you know what I'm saying, me, you know, that's why you see a lot of interracial white men now dating black women on television because their uh, reproduction uh, system is not working. And demographers predict that by the year 2050, you know, they'll be the minority, not the majority. You know, so they're now dating more black women just to preserve themselves. You know, they, they, it's all about survival. And then the black man is always targeted because when you look at the black man penis, that is the real weapon of mass destruction, says Francis Cress Wilson, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, in a book called The ISIS Paper. She speaks about that pretty eloquently. She talks about how if the black man was allowed to amalgamate with the European woman or any other ethnicity, we would wipe them out in the course of 30 years just through amalgamation. The baby but come out darker because the darker, says Mendel, who's a biologist, he said the darker genes are dominant and the lighter genes are recessive. You can get the recessive out of the dominant, but you can't get the dominant out of the recessive. So that's why black men are targeted, you know what I mean? And it's a form of male contraceptive. You know, every time you lock somebody up, you can't have babies. That's birth mm -hmm. control, you know what I'm saying? I mean, and you see that, you know, even in the welfare system, you know, they say that the man is no law, not allowed to live with the mother. So, so what you're saying, the child gonna grow up fatherless, you're creating a single parent uh, environment? Of course, you know, so it's a lot of things that creates the pimp whole relationship. It's a lot of things that create the, the, the male female relationship. It's not just one thing that's creating these prostitutes, that's creating these pimps, that's creating these situations. You know what I'm saying, me? You know, uh, the black man, you know, have to understand that uh, everything is based on reason. You have to be a thinker. A lot of us don't think. Your, 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 your thinking faculties, your reasoning faculties and your emotional, emotional factory, faculties is not in the same place. That's why when somebody kills somebody, they do, they kill them on impulse. You know, they say they snap because emotions should never supersede each other. You know, a, a temporary, a, a, a a temporary situation would cause a permanent effect. You know, how many brothers you know from your hood in the Bronx that they killed somebody, where well, all they needed was 10 seconds, say, man, they're going to be $10. You know, that ain't shit. You know, I go. That's go so pop. real. That is you know? so real. You know, but that's because emotions and reasoning, one is that, you know, your, 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 your reason is, is in your conscious level. Your uh, emotions is 95% of the we do, thing we do is unconscious, in your unconscious, subconscious level. So, to give you an example of emotions and reasoning, if, if I was a hunter, right, and I had a, a shotgun, and I put that shotgun up to an a ox, right? You know, ox is strong, right? Ox is strong as an ox. 
and that ox, he's gonna, he's not going to remove, he's not gonna move unless he hear a tree or you know something strikes his emotion. He's gonna emotionally respond. He's gonna run off impulse, but he don't know that the gun is gonna kill him and make him some oxtails. You know, he's gonna be some oxtails. He don't know that. But if I put the gun on you, you're gonna be like, shit, man, that nigga got a gun, run. You know, that's reasoning. You know, if you take a lion, we just talked about a lion, right? And you put a lion in a situation where you take a cow, cut the cow in half, and you put the cow in the cage, and you try to trap that lion in that cage, that lion don't have enough reasoning faculties to understand that it's a trap. He's going to go in there every time, go for the cow, and he's going to become a zoo animal. You feel what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying, me? But we have the ability to reason, but we don't reason. You know what I'm saying, me? We, we impulsive. You know what I'm saying? We move on impulse. And to give example, Sir Isaac Newton, who's a great scientist who came up with the theory of relativity and talked about the moon and the stars and gravity and everything, right? He was uh, in England in the 1800s. And it was a guy by the name of uh, uh, John Blunt. And so John Blunt, what he did, he came up with the sea company and the sea company, you know, was similar to what Bernie Mur Murdoch had. He was robbing Peter Pay Paul. It was a Punchy scam. And people mm -hmm. was investing, 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 investing. The queen invested. All of the lawyers, everybody invested. Even one of the maids invested. And the maid who she worked for, one of these ladies, one of the ladies, she was sitting in the in, in, in the general area. And the, and the maid was sitting up in the uh, in the bleachers, in the VIP. And so she looked up. She said, how did you get up there? Well, I invested in John Blunt. He was just the talk of the town. So Sir Isaac Newton was like, hmm, he had 7,000 pounds. You know, he bought, he invested 7,000 pounds of English money, and, and they call it pounds in England. He, he invested 7,000 pounds into this company of John Blunt's. He made 21,000, a multiple of three. He said, wow. He said, man, I'm going to get out of here because he, uh, he came up with relativity. What goes up must come down. This was his theory, you know, which is a good theory. And, you know, so he was like, you know, I'm out. But the stock kept going up. And he died back in and he lost everything. He became impoverished at seven years old. And he said, I would never allow my emotions to supersede my intelligence. It was because of greed, emotional greed, that I've lost my entire fortune. So we have to think, you know, and we got to focus. When I say focus, I'm talking about putting your eye in the keyhole and looking through that keyhole. Nothing else counts. You have your peripheral is totally out the, out the question. Nothing to the right, nothing to the left. You're just in that keyhole. And you don't see nothing but your purpose. And that's what you have to do. You have to look in that keyhole. You know, one of the techniques that I use to control my uh, focus is I, I count my breathing. Every day I count my breathing. And no matter where, where or when or how or, or where I'm at, I always wander into something else. The phone might ring. You know what I'm saying? If the phone don't ring, something else might happen. You know what I'm saying? But I'm always wondering, you know, I'm always wondering to something else. But then how I get focused is I said, go back to your breathing. So when I got something that I'm embarking on, like the hip hop fraternity, if, you know, somebody said, man, hey, we got this popping over here. Or we got that popping over there. Of course, it distracts me momentarily. But I always say, go back to the hip hop fraternity. You know what I'm saying? So these are techniques that I use to stay focused, you know, because we have to stay focused. If we don't stay focused, we're going to get lost in the sauce. You know, give you another example. It was this guy. He was a, a country boy. You know, he didn't, you know, he didn't go to school. You know, all he could focus on was being a filmmaker, right? He had this insatiable appetite to be a filmmaker. Somebody from Hollywood discovered him and brought him out to Hollywood, let him work on a project that was successful, let him work on another project that was successful. And he made a lot of money. Then they told him, well, we want you to use Final Cut Pro. He said, I'm not using Final Cut Pro. He was so focused on doing it the way he wanted to do it that he didn't allow them to deter him. So eventually, you know, he wanted to make this movie. So he went off and he made the movie. The movie is called Star Wars. John Lucas, you know what I'm saying, me, who started Lucasfilm, and the reason why we get Star Wars and why it's so successful because he refused to let anybody take him out of his focus. You know what I'm saying, me? Even though no one at that time was financing movies. It was idiotic. 
it was absurd to finance your own movie back in them days. But he financed his own movie and he had a belief, he had a dream, and whatever the mind believed and conceived, it can achieve. You know, a winner never quit, a quitter never win. Plan your work and work your plan. That's what John Lucas did. And that's how you come up with Lucas film. And that's why Star Wars, which we still watch to this day, is so successful. It's about being focused, you know. So, you know, yeah, you know, we have reasoning and we have impulse, you know, but your emotional uh levels can be raised on different levels because it's called emotional question, emotional quotient, IQ. Just like that, you got EQ, you got IQ. IQ is an intellectual quotient, EQ is emotional question quotient. And there's different levels to that, you know what I mean? And, you know, it got to do with like empathy and stuff like that, you know, uh, reasoning. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, just different things, you know, how you feel uh, about something, you know, and you can control that, you know, you know, and you control it by judging everything by not, you don't judge things by uh, how you feel about it, but you judge things by what it costs you. You know, gotcha. What you is, know, what, go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, what what is the results of those actions? So, if you if, if you want to kill somebody, the way you control your emotions, say what is going to cost me. Every time you feel like making an emotional impulse, say what is going to cost me, and that's how you control your emotions. And a lot nah, of people, that's um very very smart. Well said. You you know you can I I've watched um several interviews on yourself and you you are highly intelligent just listening to you speak you're well read um you are far more than the pimping at the top of your name it, it, it's obvious that you're a very very intelligent man um you know Malcolm was a pimp too right absolutely so you know, Absolutely. hey, hey, one more for the Pippin. <laughs> Malcolm makes Pippin kid. You know, what I'm <laughs> yeah, I come from the same cloth he come from. Yeah, and, and and that's another one. Like you said, well read, well read. Um, was you know, we started at the top of this conversation, and you was telling me about the hip hop fraternity. Mm -hmm. Why was it important for you to found? that fraternity and what is it exactly well uh i was having a discussion with ice t and he was telling me about uh the zulu nation african bombada now and he was telling me about the rap syndicate which is something that he had got into it and he formed the rap syndicate based on uh, uh watching Luc lucky luciana or the commission yeah you know, and how they had all the bosses sit down and he was telling me about that and uh I was telling him about my son acting in Hollywood and can he get him a job and stuff like that, you know, and you know, we were just talking about maybe we need to have some kind of, you know, union or something, you know, so when people like that come through, you know, we have a way to, you know, reference some people and they have some kind of, you know, assistant. So I came up with the Hip Hop Fraternity and, you know, we concluded that the best way to start it is to create a system where each state will operate like the United States. Each state would have their own governor. And Atlanta would be Washington, D.C. Instead of the White House, we had a Black House here in Atlanta. And each state would be responsible for their chapter. You know, they structure their chapter. We give them a guideline, you know, and they are structured. And then this way, you know what I'm saying, we can duplicate ourselves and create multiple Atlantas throughout the United States. And this would make it easier for them to share each other music, to, you know, have a, a networking system, have a support system and have a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And we could buy each other music and so on and so forth. You know what I'm saying? I me mean, almost like a black think tank. You know what I mean? I heard of this organization. I don't want to say the organization, but I heard they got a council of seven. And in this council of seven, they got seven leaders at the top. So each seven of those leaders got seven people up under them to the seventh power. And that's how they make decisions, you know, from the seven at the top. And then it permeates throughout the whole uh, community. So us having hip hop fraternity and having 30 chapters already in 30 different cities and over 100 executives, it gives us the power to meet on a biweekly level and to disperse information. If somebody has somebody that's kind of hot in their chapter, artist or something like that, we all agree to push that artist. 
So when we meet up as the is at the hiphopfraternity.com. So that's the social media. It's the same thing as IG and Facebook. So we all sign up there and we meet there, you know, and we can see each other. They can upload videos. We got daily news, you know, we got HHF radio, HHF clothing, hip hop fraternity award shows. So we self-contain, you know, and, and, and you know, we compare each other notes. We we empower and we, we level each other up. And as we become more scalable in the future, we're going to have our own streaming service like iTunes. We got our own award show, our own radio station. We got our own clothing line, HHF clothing. All those HHF jackets you see on the line, those are our clothing line. So, you know, we are creating a system where, you know, like, for example, if you want to be HHF, the Bronx, we got our biggest, one of our biggest chapters in New York. We got Brother James uh, Gray, who's the uh, CEO, national, national, he's CEO of New York, and he's the national spokesperson for the hip-hop fraternity. So, we uh, help you set up a chapter in New York. We give you a license agreement, but you have your own LLC. So you'll be controlling and running everything yourself, but you'll be DBA as hip hop fraternity. So it creates an avenue for all of us to be connected, but yet independent and you know be our own sole proprietors when it comes to leadership. I don't know what's going on in the Bronx, but you do. Mm-hmm. So it's better for me to have you start a chapter in the Bronx and let you have uh, autonomy and independence. But yet, you know, you can send all your people over to the hiphopattorney.com, which is a social media, which is our IG, where we all can cohabitate and we can all communicate. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and we are a data company. We are a, a, a media-based company. So in the future, we will be allowing other advertising and marketing companies to come and advertise with us on our radio and, and our magazine on our social media, you know, we created that venue for ourselves. You know, we are looking for investors, you know, for growth capital, but they can't own the company. You know, we own the uh, trademark, you know, we own the trademark hip hop fraternity. And the reason why I believe the word hip hop fraternity is developed because you had the East Coast versus the West Coast. You know, you had Def Jam versus uh, some other company. You know, you had Bad Boy versus uh, Death Row. No limit versus cash money. This was a separatist business. But what we're doing at the hip hop tournament, we said, look, you know, if we come together on un- one umbrella, and if we use our numbers, which is strength, then we can control the entire industry because it's our culture, our call. And we can use that leverage to have record labels to come over and, and give us money to run the system ourselves because we have a system in place. We've got a machine bigger than their machine because we're creating the machine. And we know all the components of hip hop, you know, and by me being a literary agent, just signing Boosie to a book deal and signing Ice Cube to a book deal and helping uh, me and Steel helping Boosie with the liquor deals and helping with the cologne deals and helping them over there at Rap Snack. That gives us, you know, another means of uh, avenue of creating equity partnerships with our artists, you know. So we become a management company by default, we become a record label by default. And we're giving them game. So every Monday we meet, and at the onset of the meeting, we do what you call hip hop facts. So we teach them about cryptology. We teach them about ASCAP, BMI, CSAT, you know, about near fear communication, NFCs and you know, NFTs and stuff like that, the blockchain, cryptology. So they can have a full range about the music business, which is 90% music and 10% uh, 10% music, 90% business. There you go. So, that's and then we let them perform for free, and we let them in for free because they artists, and we trying to create an American Idol slash Apollo within our infrastructure because we don't never know when the next uh, Michael Jackson or next Lil Wayne gonna come from. It might work at McDonald's, so if you let them come in for free, then you get first dabs at them. You know, you just touched on this, um, and I want to go a little deeper into it if you don't mind. Yeah. You you have a production deal um, to produce books for Simon & Schuster, which is it's phenomenal. Congratulations. You know, many people don't know that about you and how you have really just evolved as a businessman. How did that book deal come um, to be? And also, you mentioned you signed people like Boosie to a book deal, Ice-T to a book deal. How, how did the deals even come? Lil Wayne? Corey, Corey Wise, I signed him too. Gotcha. Central Park, Central Park Five. Corey yep, Wise. yep. 
when they see us, yeah, he's one of my authors that I sign as well. Well, how did okay. you get that book deal? Okay, so I'm riding in my car one day. My manager called me, said, "Hey, man, this company called Simon Schuster. We want to do a book deal with you." I said, "How much they charge?" He said, "Twenty-five thousand. I said, "That won't even pay for the front end clip on my Benz." You know, fuck them. Tell them I said, fuck them. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was ghetto, you know. <laughs> but I said, fuck them, you know. And so four years later, uh, Jeremy Stratus, Ruby Stratus, who's uh, one of the senior publishers over there, he called again. He said, tell him we got a quarter million dollars. That'll buy him a new Benz, you know. <laughs> so I, said, tell him, I said, tell him uh, it's a deal. And so they gave me one point, uh, 125000 Never wrote a book in my life. I don't know where it came from. I just, I wrote that motherfucker in 30 days. Pip Algy was wrote, written in 30 days. I had a co-author named Ken Hunter, but she said, you do such an excellent job. We had to do very little editing with you. So the book was done. They gave me my other uh, money. And, you know, uh, the book actually did really well. You know, they made millions and millions of dollars off the book. It was a bestseller. It's in like it's 22 printing. Average book don't go but two or three prints. It's in its 22nd printing. They still print the book. It's still selling like uh, never before. And so that developed a relationship. So I came back five years later in 2015. I said, hey, man, I want my uh, the rights to my audio book. At that time, audio books wasn't doing well, but I loved audio books. I said, this, this is going to pick up one day because you could drive and listen to books. You know, and I did a lot of traveling. So I knew it was going to pop. So they said, well, we need 50,000. So what I did was I told them I agreed to it, but it was a clause in my contract with the paperback, with the hardcover book. It said when the book revert, the word revert is a very interesting word. I didn't know what it mean at the time, but it said when the book revert to paperback, my royalties go from 15% to 5%. And I didn't know that. So my royalties wasn't coming in. So when they told me they are going to sell me my audio rights, what I did was I, uh, I went on the internet and I uh, got me a contract. I hooked it up, put a Jewish thing on there, you know, uh, you know, Glenn Bird, you know, and uh, as it was my lawyer, you know, and uh, I, I told myself I'm ready to, to do, the, do the deal. So I went to Manhattan and I'm in the Simon Schuster building. We're sitting in the room with all the lawyers, motherfuckers graduated from Harvard, Yale, Columbia University, they smart motherfuckers. And so I, I, I didn't want them to read the contract first. I said, let me just sign, let me sign a check, you know, right quick, you know, endorse the check, you know. So they said, okay. So I act like I endorsed the check, but I did not flip it over, left it on the middle of the table. And I said, you know, you know, do y'all want, you know, whatever. So they scanned through the contract. I had a clause in there that the, the royalties of the uh, pimpology would come from the future royalties of pimpology. They didn't understand what I said, you know. They looked at it and uh, they endorsed it. As soon as they endorsed it, I said, I got used to the restroom. I left. My publisher called me and said, hey, Ken, you never signed a check. I said, what check? He said, that was the deal. I said, did they read the contract? And uh, so he laughed and, you know, it was a big thing. I'm like a, I'm an iconic figure over at Simon Schuster because here I am, a ghetto boy, you know, from the ghetto, the slums of Milwaukee and Chicago, you know, ex-convict. I just got over on, you know, five top flight lawyers. You know what I'm saying? And I own 100% mm -hmm. rights of my audio book. So you go to audiobook.com, you're going to see publisher, Kid Ivy. And they liked it that. They liked that my shrewd business fits. They, they liked that I was a, a shrewd businessman. And they said, hey, you know, we want to be partners with you. And that's how we became partners. We've been making money, millions of dollars ever since. That's dope. That's a dope story, brother. Um, before I let you up out of here, Ken, you clearly, you, 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 true businessman. You, you're evolved. Let's let's use that word. You still, you still got the hustle. You, you still are a hustler. You still pimping the game out, just in a different way. But how does an ex pimp evolve from a personal standpoint? Do you have a wife? 
Can you well, love a woman the way a regular square would love his wife? How, how well, does it work for you? The thing, the thing you got to understand, right, is that, you know, a person, you know, uh, pimping ain't who I am. Pimping is what I've done. You know, pimping ain't who I am. Pimping is what I've done. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times when people look at you, they look at you from the perspective of just what you've done, not who you are. And a lot of times people, you know, they get a misconception, you know, that you are just this cold hearted person that you are not capable of loving anyone. You know, of course, nowadays, you know, it's easy for me to love because I'm no longer in that lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm no longer connected to that lifestyle. So therefore, you know, what I mean, I'm not dealing with the same type of women that I deal with in the past. You know, so, you know, I'm dealing with women, you know, that you know, that, that may be a little bit different, you know what I'm saying? And me coming from, you know, a Christian background and my mother being a, a Christian, you know, even though, you know, she was with my daddy for a few years, you know, and, and just dealing with that, she eventually got saved, you know, when I was about 13 years old. And we had to go to church, you know, a lot, even though I was in Algeria every time home, my mom would preach. God to us. And so, you know, I got that God like uh spirit as well. You know, so I'm 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 a Christian, a Muslim, I'm a Buddhist, I'm everything. You know what I'm saying? I, mean, I believe in God. Whatever your God is, is my God. You know, so yeah, you know, in that respect, you know, uh I've changed and you know, uh I I I, you know, you know, I deal with women, you know, a little different. Then I would deal with them back in the past, you know. Um, you know, I'm more, you know, a family man, you know. Uh, my woman and I, you know, we, you know, you know, we raised our children, you know what I'm saying? I had children, we raised our children, our children went to college, you know what I'm saying? Me, you know, and uh, you know, we're friends, you know, we, you know, we don't we don't argue, we don't fight, you know what I'm saying? You know, we don't we're not into all of that. You know, we have disputes often, you know, but it's never to the point where, you know, I'm, I'm abusive or I'm, I'm physically putting my hand on them. You know, and then like to say I'm intelligent. So any woman that be with me, and particularly my woman, when she's with me, you know, she's getting the intelligence, you know, she's getting wisdom from me. You know what I'm saying? She's not getting the old Kenny. You know, she's mm -hmm. not getting that slick stuff. I'm not trying to figure out how to raise her skirt. You know, I'm trying to raise her thoughts. Have you ever bumped into any of your old prostitutes that you used to have out there? <laughs> All the time. Are you serious? I mean, you see them, you don't bump into them, but you see them out there, you know. You know, I mean, my thing is like, you know, the, the, the game is so cold, it's so real, right? You don't, you know, you 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 don't never put those people on the same plateau as you would put, say, your wife or, you know, your girlfriend, you know, because you know that deep down inside, like she know deep down inside, that's Pippin Ken. Deep uh -huh. down inside, I know that that's whole so-and-so, you know what I'm saying? I know she still had those whole tendencies. She know I still had those pimp tendencies. So we kind of do this to each other, you know? It's like <laughs> two vampires, you know, like, nigga, you stay away, I'm stay away. I know who you is, nigga. I know what you came for, bitch. I know who you came for. Let's just stay the fuck away from each other. <laughs> you, 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 I know you married. I know you did your thing. I know I got my situation. I know we ain't no longer the game, but just stay away. You know, and I think, you know, that's healthy for both people. Because, you know, Yo, it's, that's it's, crazy. So you actually bump heads with these people and y'all just be like, yo. We go. We we know who we are. Like, keep living your life. I'm gonna keep living keep, mine. Keep it moving, man. Keep it moving. You understand? Know because you know, a lot of times, you know, the relationship in the game that you have with a prostitute is gonna be way different than you have with your wife. You know, or with your girlfriend. It's a different relationship. So you know, there's certain things that you want to keep the integrity to. You know, you want to keep the integrity of the game alive. Neither one of us don't never want to forget that we really was about that. You know, we lived that life. So it's like a it's like a, a national chest treasure, some shit, you know, it's like a historical site. 
You know what I'm saying? You know, we, we live that life. You know what I'm saying? Me, we're going to leave that life back there. You know, and we're not going to try to pursue anything else. But, you know, go ahead. You know, the thing that, you know, I think that, that where change come from, people say, how did I do it? You know, well, you know, if I had a 10 pound or 20 pound book pack on my back, right? I carried it around for 40 years, that book pack will be pimping. You know what I'm saying? That's dead weight. You know, so once you go into a situation where you take that book pack, that dead weight off you, then you feel like Muhammad Ali, you can float like a butterfly, staying like a bee. You know what I'm saying? You light now, you can move, you know, you can maneuver a little bit better, you know. Without that pimping book pack on me, that pimping stigma on me, I can deal with people a little bit more equitable, you know what I mean? A little bit more, you know, uh, professional, right? And then, you know, I think the biggest problem with people is that they don't want to let go, you know? And sometimes it's good to say goodbye because the word good is a goodbye, you know? I don't know if you know about the eagle, but the eagle is the most profound of all the human birds. The eagle wings is nine feet. When the eagle flies, soars through the air, you know what I'm saying? If the eagle see a pigeon, pigeon, because he flies so high, he knows he's flying too low. That's how he know when he see a, a, another species or the bird species, he know he got to go up. When the eagle see a storm, he goes into the storm and shoot up the storm because the storm propels him to a higher aptitude. You know, chickens, you know, they, you know, they always pack in. The chicken eat their own feces. The chicken eat anything. That's why a chicken's so fat. A chicken can't fly like an eagle. That's why you never see an eagle and a chicken make a love. You know what I'm saying? I mean, eagle will see his prey. It can see his prey 100 miles away. And his claws are so strong that he claws into the prey and he pulls the prey up. You can see eagles grabbing wolves and dogs and sheep and all kind of things. And it grab and he pick it up and, and, and go with it. But when the eagle see a weasel, he do the same thing. He claws into the weasel. He pull the weasel to him and he fly. He ascend 10,000 feet and then he descend 10,000 feet to his death because he refused to let the weasel go because the weasel is the biggest mistake of the eagle because the weasel eats into his chest. Then eventually the weasel eats his heart off and that's why he descend to his death. And, you know, when we change in our life, when we're making the transition, you, you know, if you want to change your mentality, you got to change your reality. If you want to change your aptitude, you got to change your attitude. Sometimes we got to let the weasels out of our life. And then the transition become possible. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, Ken, this has been a, a, a dope conversation, man. Um, it really has been. You, you, I love your intellect. I love your insight. Um, don't agree with all of the things that you did in your life, but at least you provided us with an understanding. And it's so happy to see you to Yo, see. And some people don't agree with everything you did either. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, and, and that's so 100% we, we, true. We walking on fairground. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the Nobody fact that you, man. Everybody come from somewhere, man. I know some niggas is so, so, so deadly. You know what I mean? You think I'm something. I know some people they cut your eyes out, send them to your mama. They cut your penis out, put it in your mouth. Rufus. No. But nobody I know, I know people it. just like that. I but know nobody people never just know like that, right? Nobody never know they like that, right? But when we live in the public, uh, I, you know, a lot of our, our activities on display, you know, so people form opinions before they meet us, you know. But once people meet you and they get a chance to hobnob with you, they realize that you know you can't inhale new air unless you exhale old air in with the new, all with the old. You know, so it's about reinventing yourself and becoming a new person. No, and I love, I love, you know, first and foremost, um, you really given the psychology and the understanding of, of what it's like to have lived in that life. I, I think it's going to be uh, uh, an awakening for so many people who get a chance to, to listen and uh, watch this conversation but also to show the evolution. Don't matter what you did, you know, we can all change. Malcolm was my idol. So I'm just doing what Malcolm did. Malcolm changed his life. I'm changing my life. There you go. There you go. But man, I appreciate your time, Ken. And I would love to have you back from time to time. If, if you 
you know, grace us with, with more of your time. So thank you so much. Continue blessings to you. Peace and love, brother. Peace and love, brother. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.